Okay, uh, this week I am really pleased to have a very special guest. His name is Jean-Marc Peltier. He is the person who is behind a piece of technology that a lot of people use or have used. It's called the CV JIT objects. And, and basically it was an opportunity for people who are users of Macs to take advantage of some of the technologies related to computer vision. And I have seen so many projects that use the CVJIT systems, it has become a really important part of people's toolbox. Now, unfortunately, um, uh, over time, they started getting a little brittle as some of the underlying Max technology changed, as well as some of the underlying operating system technology. But just recently, a number of people at Cycling74 have been working with Jean-Marc to put to, to update uh, this object set and make them again available for people that are using Mac 7 so that they can get back into play with this computer vision stuff. I'm really excited about that. It's going to be launched um, off of a website called maxology.club. I will have a link to that on the, on the podcast website. But beyond that, I am really interested to talk to Jean-Marc. So uh, Jean-Marc, uh, welcome. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I appreciate you taking the time. Now, uh, I'll let the listeners know, I'm, talk I'm talking to you in the mid-evening my time, but it's early morning the next day in your time because you are in Japan right now, correct? Yeah. 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 Um, what are you doing out there? Um, well, currently I'm teaching in a university, the Nag Nagoya Zoke University of Art and Design. I uh, actually just started working here since April. Oh, okay. Interesting. Well, fantastic. Um, can you uh, tell us about, uh, beyond, beyond teaching, what are, you, what are you working on right now? Uh, well, currently I'm just settling into my new job. That's <laughs> I see. Uh, taking a lot of time um, and, and trying to think of what I'm going to do next. next. I mean, uh, th this you know, change of job was, was, I hope, is going to be an opportunity to be a start new things, but I'm just trying to think of what I, I want to do. I, I, there's lots of things I want to do, but try to decide what I really want to do. And uh, so, yeah, there's nothing really uh, in, in the short term planned, but uh, hopefully a lot of interesting things uh, are going to be happening in the mid and long term. Fantastic. Well, yeah. I, my, I'm going to go under the assumption that the listeners... Um, understand some, uh, at least what computer vision is, and, and maybe a yeah. bunch of them will be aware of how the CVJIT things have impacted the Max community. But um, in my podcast, one of the things I always want to know about is how people became the artists that they are. And in your case, I'm specifically interested because uh, my interactions with you and your work have always been fascinating, but always there's always a depth there that I appreciate and sometimes maybe even find a little intimidating. But I'm curious how you got to be the, the artist that you are. Um, well, it, it's going to be a long answer, but uh, at the core of it is that I can't focus on one thing and I can't see something that I like without also wanting to do it. And that's been with me you know, ever since I was, I was born. I think. So um, at the very beginning, I guess, it, it started around 1984. Uh, I was about eight, nine years old at the time. And uh, that's when I got my first computer. It was a Commodore 64. And uh, that's also when I started programming because I had no choice. You needed to have some basic to just interact with the thing. Right. And I couldn't get any software because there wasn't any place, you know, selling cassettes anywhere near where I lived. And so the only way I could get software was to buy books and magazines that had code listings and just transcribe the programs. And uh, when I ran out of cassettes to, to record the programs, then I just had to like type the program every time I wanted to use it. So that's how I got started in programming. And around the same time, I was uh, very much, even though I was pretty young, I was very much into art. And uh, I started taking uh, painting lessons. And uh, also, I was also very much into music. I loved classical music and I started taking piano lessons and learning music. And, 
and I, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be a, a musician. I wanted to be an artist, and I wanted to, to keep on working with computers, and and I wanted essentially be everything. Right. Uh, and uh, but I was very, very much in, in, into classical music, and uh, I like classical music because, um, well, because of, of the the, uh, the the power I, I felt it had to, to convey emotions, but also because. Uh, the way that some of it was uh, capable of uh, evoking very strong mental imagery. I would you know, close my eyes and, and listen to, well, especially uh, late 19th century composers, and I would just like uh, imagine all sorts of landscapes and stories and, and, and images. And, and that was uh, you know, very powerful experiences. And at the same time, also, this was the 80s, and I, I just hated the music on radio. Uh, and it was all synth pop, and it was all clean and slick, and, and a lot of it was very mechanical. It was the, the age of MIDI, and I hated all that because it was very much unlike the classical music that I loved. Right. And so I, I just hated synthesizers. It was like the, the symbol of all that was wrong with music in the 80s, and I couldn't believe that everyone was listening to, the, to that. And, and, and So I was just like, you know... Uh, Listening to, to my my Beethoven and and Saint-Saëns and Ravel cassettes and and just wondering what why everyone was listening to synth pop, so that was the the eighties, and once I got into the nineties, I started becoming a bit more proficient in programming and writing my little my own uh, you know, text adventures and and graphical games and and uh, you know, it was all in basic and it, it was but essentially yeah I, I I got into gaming and it was wasn't just I couldn't just play the games I had to make them too and uh, eventually when I came time to go uh, to university uh, I, I got into movies so I, I would go to the theater you know at least once a week I would you know rent movies almost every day and I was just really into movies and I couldn't just watch movies I had to make them too <laughs> and uh, I, I've always been like that and and so uh, because that sort of coincided with with uh, you know, going to university, I, I thought I'm, I'm going to, you know, become a filmmaker. And uh, there were two places that I was considering, both in uh, Concord University. I, I'm I'm from uh, Montreal, okay, Montreal, Canada. And so there was Concord University there. I ended up going to the, the communication studies department uh, because they they taught film, and also they you know they, they taught lots of other things. And, and it ended up it ended up being a really good move because I I can't focus on just one thing. Right. And um, so I went there, and by that time I, I sort of like reconciled myself with electronic music because the '80s were over, and and the aesthetic of the '90s was very different. It was all this very moody and gritty music that was coming out. You know, it was like trip hop and and acid jazz, right. and there was like I, I, IDM was was coming out, and, and suddenly like electronic music didn't just have to be uh, you know, slick and mechanical. It could also be very moody and also evoke the, these strong, you know, images and and, and emotions, and, and and of course I couldn't just then just listen to electronic music. I had, I had to, to make, make it, it too. <laughs> right. Yeah. So so then I, I thought, well, I, maybe I'm going to try to take some some classes at the music department, and um, so I, I I called up the music department and they suggested I, I take a class called electroacoustic music because you know a lot of communication studies uh, students were, were taking it. And I really didn't know what I was getting into, and I, I registered. And uh, I didn't know what electro was like. I knew it had electro, so I thought maybe I'm going to learn something, you know, it had something to do with electronic music. And uh, on the first class, the first piece of electronic music that I heard uh, was by uh, Montreal composer uh, Gilles Gobeil. And you know, a lot of composers in Montreal are, are working in, in a style of, uh, you know, French uh, acousmatic music, uh, music concrète. Sure. And sometimes it gets called uh, cinema for the ears. And Gilles Gobet's music is very much like that. And I heard the piece, and then it was, in, it was extremely vivid, you know, images that, that I, I was seeing. It was like, really, there was a, a movie happening in my mind as I was listening to those sounds. And I thought, wow, you can do movies and music at the same time. And I, I thought, well, I, I really want to do this. And uh, at the same time, I realized that I, I love 
movies. I loved thinking about movies. I loved imagining movies I'd like to make. But I didn't like making movies all that much. Uh, I thought, you know, the, the whole shooting process was just not for me. And so I ended up spending most of my time uh, at Concordia making music, electronic music, electroacoustic music, and also uh, taking classes in Japanese. And um, so I, I, I sort of built up my, my, my own vocabulary, my, and uh, it was very much like, like painting. You know, I'd been painting for a long time, and you know, instead of layering colors, you were layering sounds. But it, it was, you know, a very non-real-time process. You would go out, record some sounds, you know, chop them up and, and, and process them, and then layer them, and then edit some more. And then, and it, it was very, and I, I like this, but it was uh, very much working like, like a, you know, a sculptor. And uh, eventually I ended up uh, getting into dance. I, I went to see some dance shows and, and contemporary dance, and I thought, wow, I want to do this. But I, I realized that I, I was going to be a terrible dancer. It was just not going to work. I, not for me. Right. And I, I thought, well, but I can still get involved in dance because I, I, I do music. Right. And, and so I, I started you know, telling people that you know, I would, would be interested in working with dancers. And in, in Montreal, it is big, uh, has a big and vibrant art community, especially performing arts. And, and there are lots of dancers. So if you, if you just, you know, say like this, I'm, I'm a composer and I would like to write music for dancers, then dancers will come uh, and, and say, please do music for me. And, and so I, I started collaborating with, with dancers and that was a big shock because I realized that they had a very different approach to time than wow. I had. Yes. Um, so I, I remember we had a meeting and I asked them, well, how long is the piece going to be? And I was expecting an answer like the piece is going to be between eight minutes and thirty-two seconds and eight minutes and thirty-five seconds. That was the sort of time scales I was working on. Uh, I was, you know, I was working with with very uh, precise gestures and phrases that were very crafted, and and I was, you know, working just when I was editing at you know a millisecond uh, level, just getting things right. And they, they, then they, they told me, well, the piece, I, I guess the piece is going to be between 10 and 15 minutes, but probably not more than 20. <laughs> and, and I was just, I, I can't work like this. You know, this, <laughs> like my, my whole tool set is worthless. And, and I thought, wow, this is going to be a, a big problem. And they were in, really into improvisation. And, and you know, the, the sort of pieces I was writing with all these you know, very calculated, you know, structures and, and, and phrases and all that. And it was just, I mean, it, it forced a structure on, on, on the whole piece that, that they didn't really like. So I thought this is going to be terrible. But in the end, things ended up working really well. And we did some uh, really good performances and ended up writing, uh, compromising and getting rid of all these nice gestures and instead writing very ambient sound, soundscapes. And they compromised, and we sort of agreed that we were sort of going to decide on on on, on a length for the piece, and what was going to happen within that length, it was going to be a, a bit open. Uh, but still, that that made me feel like, gee, I I'd like to have like a bit more flexible approach to time. And I didn't really know how to to approach this because everyone around me was doing this using the same you know techniques of. Uh, sort of French school electroacoustic music where, you know, you record, you process, you edit, and everything is, is like a sculpture. Right. And uh, I, I saw around that time a, a dance performance. Uh, I think it was by, uh, the choreographer was uh, Marie Chouinard. And uh, the, um, the music was by um, another Montreal composer called uh, Louis Dufault, who's a little bit older than I am, I think. And I, I'd met him a couple of times and and uh, I think they were using uh, what was it the, the uh, I cube system oh, uh, yeah, right, right. with with, with uh, you know sensors. So so the the dancers had, had these sensors strapped on, on on their bodies, and I didn't really know what was going to happen uh, going into the, the performance. And and when the dancers started moving, then there were these sounds that were like perfectly synchronized their movements, and and, and that was. 
I thought it was incredible. I mean, like it, it, it sort of was as though the dancers were, you know, were transformed into, you know, something else. There was this audiovisual object where, where the, the, the motion of, of the dancers and the motion of the sound was just in such perfect sync that that was also a, you know, a very strong experience. So that was the positive side. But the negative side was that I was very distracted by the sensors themselves. Because you had these wires, you know, and, and the costumes were, were very minimalistic, you know, which was good because it, it really emphasized, you know, the, the, the natural uh, movement and, and, you know, the beauty of, of, of the body. Right. And, but then you had these wires and, and then the, these wireless transmitters. And I started talking to dancers about this and I said, yeah, yeah, we really don't like, you know, striping, you know, sensors on, on ourselves. And it's, it's very limiting and, and then, you know, sometimes they, they fall off and then, you know, you have to, this this big transmitter that you can't. You know, for, if you want to feel like you're rolling on, on the floor, you can't do that. And so, realized that I didn't, as a spectator, I didn't like seeing those sensors, and and the dancers didn't like using them. But I liked the 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 product, which was you know this very uh, synchronized type coupling, yeah, synchronized right. type coupling of, of uh, audio and visuals. I ended up finding an answer in the Computer Music Journal. There was an article by Antonio Camori, who, teach, uh, who, who works at the uh, University of Genoa. And uh, he was describing uh, the software they'd made there called IceWeb. And this is where I found out about computer vision. I found out that you could use cameras as sensors and use that in, in dance performance, and that you could capture the movement of dancers without touching them. So you could get rid of the sensors. Uh, and I thought, wow, this is great. And uh, I want to do that. And but uh, then in the meanwhile, I I moved to Japan uh, to just you know see the world. I ended up staying in Japan a bit longer than I was expecting, and I started a master's degree uh, here in Japan at a school called Iyamas, the uh, Institute of Advanced Media Arts and Sciences. Uh, a, a very special, interesting school, very small also, there were only 40 students at the, the graduate school. Then trying to you know, study uh, a bit more interactive forms of, of making uh, electroacoustic and electronic music uh, and working with sensors and especially uh, cameras. And uh, I had two problems then. One was technical in that uh, a lot of the, the good software like, like IceWeb for uh, computer vision was running on Windows, and the good software for making interactive art and music, like Max, <laughs> right. was running on, on OS 9. Right. And uh, th there, were, uh, there, was, there was some software for uh, computer vision on OS 9. There was uh, Big Eye from, from Stime. Uh, and of course, there was uh, Safian as, uh, from uh, David Rockaby. Uh, but the, the techniques that they used were a bit, uh, I would say, long in the tooth. Uh, by that time, I started using them compared to what I, I was reading and, and I was, you know, studying the computer vision. It would, there are things I wanted to do that you couldn't do in these software. So when Jitter came out, I thought, well, maybe I can use this. And it was, uh, you know, it was a great software package, but I, I realized there were still a lot of things I couldn't do with it. So I almost, as soon as it came out, I, I started writing, you know, externals for, for doing computer vision and uh, things that I, I wanted to do like uh, shape analysis and uh, optical photo tracking, uh, things I, I couldn't do with the uh, ex existing packages. Right. And that ended up being CVJIT. Uh, so at the same time, the other problem that I had was that Yamas is in a small city on the outskirts of Nagoya. Nagoya is a very big, big city, but I didn't have any dancers nearby. And I wanted to, 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 you know, do interactive music to work with dancers. And I had finally, you know, the tools to do interactive music, but I didn't have any dancers. And, and that was a fundamental problem for me. And at first I, I thought, well, I'm going to try to, to do, you know, performances that aren't necessarily dance. And, uh, you know, I tried, you know, becoming a performer and that didn't really work out because <laughs> I'm not a dancer at all. And, and I thought, gee, that's a big problem. And I it forced me to think about what I really, really wanted to do. And I, I thought about what, you know, attracted me in, in these technologies. And it wasn't so much uh, 
dance. For instance, I, I, I mentioned Antonio Camuri, and, and he studies uh, how to sort of extract the uh, you know, ex- expressive ele- element of gestures. Right. And that wasn't really what interested me. It was just the perfect synchrony of, of motion, of visual and auditory motion. And uh, it, was, it, it goes back to that, that sort of the power of music to evoke uh, imagery. And, and to go to a place that, that's both you know, visual and auditory at the same time. And, and I thought, I don't need the dancers. And I just replaced the dancers with other things. Things I realized that when I, if I use cameras, I could capture just anything because it was a non-contact technology, and I, I, I thought, okay, I, what, what are things that have interesting motions? And the first thing I, I started using was smoke. I thought, you know, if if you realize that if you have smoke and you, it's backlit, that first of all, visually it's, it's it's very beautiful, but also it has very complex motion, right, and, and very unpredictable motion. And so the, the first, you know, serious piece that I, I did like this uh, was called uh, Kimiri Mai, which in, in Japanese very originally translates to smoke dance. But uh, so I use a stick of incense with, uh, and I, I, I use the camera to analyze the, the motion of, of the, the smoke and, and synchronize the, the music to this. And at, at first I wanted to do this as a performance. I would just like walk on stage uh, light up a stick of incense and leave, and, and just th- that was that was going to be the performance. Uh, but then people started asking me to do this as an installation, and it, it morphed so into more you know permanent, semi-permanent installation because you still have to defeat it incense, so otherwise it stops. <laughs> right. So that that was the sort of work I was doing, and that's how I, I got into the sort of computer vision and stuff. And then I, I went into teaching. I graduated from Yamas. And went to another school called Yamas, very confusingly, the International Academy for Media Arts and Sciences. Uh, there's a graduate school and there's a vocational school. And the vocational school uh, where I started teaching was uh, Masayuki Akamatsu, who was uh, for a long time very much involved in the Max community. Uh, he wrote uh, textbooks, uh, Max textbooks in Japanese. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we, we taught together in the, in, in the academy. And I did that for six years and then moved to uh, another university, I teach at University. And then for the last uh, two years, I was actually working as a, officially as a fellow uh, for a, a game development company. And I was making, you know, games. And uh, so all the while, uh, you know, sort of starting and never quite completing a, a PhD. And uh, I was studying, and in PhD I was studying, I realized that, you know, what was important wasn't so much the technology of computer vision, but it was you know, working with, uh, you know, visuals and, and sounds and trying, not thinking of, like, uh, sticking sounds onto visuals or sticking visuals onto sounds, but working, you know, from the middle, and I call this amodal design. You know, you're working with, like, pure motion, pure shapes, things that aren't yet uh, perceptible and then you, you sort of project this to vision and project this on, onto the sound and and part of that process was also how do you reach those, those sort of amodal shapes that you can't really perceive well then you, you, you can work from the visual and analyze the visuals and then from then you know sonify them work to sound and then go the other way but also with, with the understanding that you weren't just combining them, but also sort of reaching for sort of imperceptible middle ground. And, and it was, well, it involved, you know, technological aspects of you know, computer vision and, and synthesis, but also, you know, psychological aspect of what are some non-arbitrary mappings between uh, sound and, and vision and potentially other senses. So that, that in, in a very, very long nutshell, is, is what <laughs> what I am and what I've been doing. Well, it's really a fascinating nutshell, though. Um, no, <laughs> I, I have to ask, just because I'm, yeah. I'm curious, given, given the way the discussion started with you needing, whenever you saw something, you had to do it. And yeah. I have to admit that there's, I, I own a part of that, and I think an awful lot of people that do media art do that. And I, I'm curious, first of all, how frustrating was it 
to have those feelings at a time when there seems to be something new every 12 seconds? This is extremely difficult, and um, I, I sort of have to, to discipline myself and, and to just start you know, saying, no, I, I'm, I'm not going to become a cook. <laughs> uh, because it really, I'm, I really am like that. And, and, and I, the problem is that I've, I've spread myself very wide, but you also end up being a, a bit thin. And, and, you, you, and I have a lot of problems. People ask me, you know, what do you do? And, and I, like, I say a lot of things. Right. And um, I, I'm, a, and it's very confusing. So I'm a media artist, and people say, "Well, what do media artists do?" And I say, "Well, lots of different things." Um, and and it is very difficult and and frustrating. And I guess that's what I have to learn to just pick a few things that I really want to do and, and just stick with them for long enough that I, I actually produce something. That's the big different difficulty, you know, that you, you start lots of different projects and, and you never finish them. And that's what I have to learn to do, to just finish something. That's really kind of interesting, but it's it, that kind of obsession. It is something that I think is, is peculiar to those of us. Because if you think about it, like the community of media artists, we mm -hmm. have a tendency to all be some level of programmer, some level of photographer, some level of musician, you know, it seems like that is almost the, the ground level for that kind of artwork. And I think it, it draws a particular kind of person that has that, has that kind of obsession. It's really, it's really interesting to hear how deeply into it uh, you are, though. And, and you, you, I mean, you've identified that in yourself, which is actually really cool. Yeah. I think one one of the, the thing that's important I, I realize for me is is you have to go back to the basics, and this is what I a bit what I was trying to do in, in my 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 PhD is, is saying okay, so there are lots of different things you can do, and and but what's really fundamental about those things, and especially when you start working with technology, you know, there's like you know the new new tools that keep on coming up and all, almost every day. And if you try to, to like you know, chase that, then you're, you're just going to end up going crazy. And but so you have to go to the basics. And, and for me, the basic was really uh, people, uh, you know, the human being. And that's why I, I was interested in, in, in my case, perception, because everything that you do has to go through perception. And so there are many ways you can do visual media, for instance. Uh, but it ends up always having to go through people's eyes. And if you, if you have to understand one thing, you have to understand how people work and uh, how, how they receive, how they react, how they act, how they think. And then from that understanding, then you have to think of things that you want to do. And only then you have to, to sort of introduce technology and ask yourself, well, this is what I want to do. What's the proper tool to use? I, I got sidetracked uh, for a while. I started a project called the, the Mirage Project, where the, the question, and I realized later it was the wrong question to ask, is uh, how can you use uh, computer vision in art? And it was completely backwards. <laughs> uh, at first, I, I completely forgot that the reason I got interested in computer vision was that there was a very aesthetic problem that I was trying to solve. Uh, and that had to do with, with how, how you, you perceive a, a performance or, or an art piece. And the, the, the correct tool I identified to solve that problem was computer vision. But then I, I thought, okay, I have a good hammer, then, then what can I you know, smash with it? <laughs> and, I, and we did some good pieces, but it, it was just not very entirely productive. And instead, it was, I think it's much more productive to sort of think of, of what do you want to express what you, you wanted to you know, explore as a creator and then think about what the tools are at that precise time instead of just you know, checking the web every day to see what, what, what's you know, new. coming out. Yeah. I, I think it's interesting that 
you gravitated towards dancers who are probably, I, I've had a chance recently to start working with dancers myself. Mm -hmm. And two things hit me. One is that they are among the least technological artists that there mm -hmm. are. Yeah. And at the same time, they seem to be about the most open for anything. You yeah. know, they are willing to try anything. But um, I also agree with you, the sense, the way that they express and interact with time mm -hmm. is completely mystifying to anybody who has worked with meter and time mm -hmm. signatures and yeah. tempi. But at the same time, you'll watch them work and, you know, they'll use kind of interesting hand movements and they'll kind of... Uh, move their shoulders and their heads a little bit and that somehow communicates to everyone in the group not only what they're going to do but kind of the timing and the speed of it and it's fascinating to watch and it seems completely foreign to me yeah well i had a, an interesting experience uh working with dancers much later when I, I sort of was able to do you know interactive music and i worked on a project with uh, some of my students uh, it was a collaboration with uh, dancers who, again, were, were doing improvisation. We had a big problem in that because of, of scheduling and, and geographical issues, we, we couldn't uh, get together before the day of the performance. And so we saw everyone, they, we saw the performance on the performance. Okay. And, and they heard the music when they, they got on stage for the performance. And so there was music and there, were, there was live video also. And everything was going to be improvised. No one had no idea whatsoever what we were going to do. And uh, we knew that there was a theme. Uh, the piece was called Earth and Bodies. And it was supposed, originally supposed to be a collaboration between dance and pottery. And that part, I think, didn't go so well because it's very hard to combine dance and pottery. Um, but what I ended up doing was recording a whole bunch of, of pottery sounds and earth sounds. And I was trying to, I'm just going to, to transform a dancer's bodies in, into, you know, earth and bodies and uh, using sound. And I, we ended up, you know, deciding not to tell anyone how we were going to do our, our, you know, audio and visuals. And so even the dancers had no idea that we had, you know, cameras, you know, filming them and that we, they were you know, analyze in real time. And, and we had, you know, data coming in uh, so the musicians could, could use the, the, that data to, in, in, within their performance and, and the video artists also. And, and so as performers, we, we had more traditional controllers, but we could also, uh, you know, fade in and out that, that these, these very uh, highly synchronized, uh, you know, elements. Right. Uh, so because they, they didn't know uh, about this, uh, you know, they, they just dance, and after the performance, their dancer just told me, like, the music was amazing. It's like it knew was what I was going to do before I did it. And <laughs> I realized that if it was a, a good decision not to tell them how things work, because then, uh, in my experience, then people tend to sort of use it as an instrument. They sort of, like, want to play with it as, as, as though it was, like, a giant theremin or whatever. Right, right. And when they don't know it, then they just know that they have this confidence that I can do anything and the music is going to follow it. And, and that was very liberating. It was the complete opposite of having, you know, the sensors, sensors strapped to you and you can't do this because it, or otherwise it's going to fall off. Right. And, and they, they could just be free to improvise and have this confidence that, yes, that the visuals are, are going to follow them and, and the music is also going to follow them. But also because we were, you know, improvising using more traditional controllers it wasn't just that you know there was also a question of, of like answers and, and things that weren't synchronized and so it ended up being, being a very um, successful performance and I think part of that is that we, we just completely hid the, the technology and we it, it allowed everyone to just focus on what we wanted to express instead of, of just you know the nuts and, and bolts of, of the tools well, I think that's just, I think that's where media artists can can really learn something from working with with dancers because unlike say a performance with musicians where the existence of the instruments and the playing technique and all this stuff is directly related to the sound mm -hmm. or whatever dancers 
are they provide like a level of inter, indirection. Their their bodies are um, sort of like used to create these these spaces and these shapes and these movements. And yeah. I find I find uh, I find using the body as kind of source material is just an amazing thing. Let's talk about. I mean, we just got done talk yeah. discussing how uh, the technology should come mm-hmm. second, and I, I really think that you framed it beautifully about uh, the process. But um, we do have in the end some technology, and one of the things that I feel like is important is to honor this sense of where how you got to the to the CV, uh, the creation of the CV jet tools. It mm-hmm. wasn't. It wasn't because you saw a technology and you wanted to make it accessible. It was more that you saw a problem that you wanted to solve. Mm-hmm. Now, in the end, you created a pretty significant body of work with the CVJIT tools. Mm-hmm. How much of that was required to uh, do the specific application you saw, and how much of it was sort of like the technology then inspiring you to go a little further? The first release was mostly stuff that I was using or stuff that I thought I might need to use uh, or stuff that was just easy to implement. Right. And, um, you know, looking back, I mean, it's been, what, over you know, 12 years since the, uh, I released the externals. Oh, my goodness. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a long time. And, um, you know, I've... You know, grown up a lot as as a as a programmer, as as a developer since, since then, and I didn't really have a plan because it was just mostly stuff I did for myself. And then after that, then originally I, I it was just for me. And then you know people saw saw the external and thought, well, these look good. You know, you should you know share share them. And um, when I shared them, I I realized that one thing I, I liked about Max is that there was a very good documentation. There's clear a lot of work that had been put into making you know good tutorials, and you know there were the help files and all this, and, and I, I compared it to, to you know other software that there was a lot, you know, much poorer documentation. I thought it was an important component, so I can't you know just release externals without making decent help files to go with them. Right. So I actually spent, end up spending a lot of time on those help files, and as the you know the, the collection grew. Uh, in the, the last releases, I ended up spending more time on the help files than externals themselves. So I think that that was, uh, you know, important. And I thought, you know, you know, honestly, I had no idea how many people were using Max, but it's had certainly, you know, less people than say Photoshop. Right. And so I thought, well, it, it, even if it's a bit niche, it's still a, a niche. And then you know, Jitter is an add-on to that, so that's a niche of a niche. And I was. You know, releasing an add-on to an add-on, so like a niche of a niche of a niche. And I thought, you know, if if like a hundred people download the external, that's going to be great. And in the end, I I just I think there are like thousands of people who were using externals, and 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 then that sort of like became a project onto itself. And so just you know, I just ended up adding stuff onto it that I thought might be useful. And looking back, there was a, a distinct lack of direction. It was just mostly piling on stuff that sure. that that wasn't either easy to do or just that I thought might be useful. And there, there's stuff in there that probably I'm sure no one uses, and and I certainly don't use. Uh, but just I thought, well, maybe maybe it might be useful. And I thought just I'm going to make it and just release it right away and see if people you know use it in interesting ways. And and, and sometimes it. People did, and sometimes, well, not really. Yeah, well, one of the things that I think, and it's interesting to hear that you put that much time into the help files because I think one of the reasons why it got a lot of use was that the help files are practically project ready Mm -hmm. patches. And I say that because one of the things that's, that's really fascinating about computer vision is how you can have the same equipment or the same tooling or the same patch or programming, Mm. but different source material give you vastly different results, right? Absolutely. And so I think one of the reasons why 
your stuff got to be used so widely and I, the number of student projects I've seen that use CVG at stuff is just shocking. And the, but I think some of the reason is, is because they can take your help files, mm -hmm. they can look at their environment and they can see something that represents a, an extension of their already existent vision. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And so as a result, then, that ends up being a really fertile starting point, and then they can take it from there and run. But the way that you've done the help files, that initial mm -hmm. interaction with the CVJIT tools, is, like, charming because it does take your thing and kind of extend it just kind of by accident. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I use the, the externals in, in, in my classes too. And, and just, by the way, one thing interesting, when you look at, at you know, the download statistics, there's like a huge spike in September. <laughs> so, School. so obviously, <laughs> obviously, and, and I thought, wow, I don't, you know, keep, keep you know, very detailed, you know, statistics about, you know, who downloads, you know, so I just, I just have the numbers. But yeah, a huge, huge spike in, 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 in downloads in, in September. And I thought, well, there are lots of people using it in, in education, I guess. Right. And, um, but that's very flattering because you know I was using the tools in my classes too, and that was a bit the the idea. You know, I didn't didn't want to spend too much time you know talking about you know, the boilerplate. I just wanted to, to start using stuff and see what people wanted to use. So yeah, I sort of uh, made the help files as, as as starting points that you could just use and then and build on you know onto. So I'm happy that I'm I'm not you know other people are using it that way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm curious about what has your attention now. Since you have this desire to mm -hmm. try and do everything, I mean, it sounds like you set cooking aside. But yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering, I mean, especially, you know, in, this, in the technological world where we have sort of like the ubiquitous smartphones with mm -hmm. cameras everywhere um, and yeah. sound producing tools everywhere, what in that milieu, or maybe in a different area, is has got you fascinated right now? Well, I one of the when you start working with, with computer vision, uh, I I got into that because of, of art and, and dance and performance, and um, it, it also opens a door onto uh, you know, a world I, I wouldn't you know have known otherwise, and uh, I remember reading. Uh, a survey. I think it was researchers in, in computer vision. I, the question was something like, uh, "What do you think are, are the fields that will, uh, you know, benefit from computer vision in, in the future?" And art was nowhere on the list. And at the top, there was like uh, defense and security. And of course, the, you know, people are using, say, for instance, uh, these externals to, to make, you know. Art, but you can also use the same technologies to do surveillance, and, and of course right. now that's that's a big you know topic. And even before people talk, you know, started talking, you know, very widely about this, you know, I, as I was you know studying the techniques, I realized well, there's also a really dark side to this, and there's an external I actually thought about doing, and then I, I decided not to do. There's a, a face detection object there. It tells you if there's a face in the image. But I also wanted to do a, a face recognition external mm -hmm. that would allow you to tell you, uh, to say, well, it is whose face it is. And, and I thought, I'm not going to do this external because I'm not sure I really want to make this technology easy to use. Right. Because it, it has a really dangerous side to it. Right. Uh, even if, if, you know, the bad guys can still make those tools. It's really something I, I, I didn't want to go there. Even though that there were clearly potential applica artistic applications, there there's that computer vision and also you know the algorithm process, you know, are have this this thing that bothers me, and especially you know recently it's sort of a lot of it has to do with like replacing people, and and I see that there's you know a certain culture and especially in. in I don't want to call it Silicon Valley culture, but in, in the, the geek world, where there's a certain, you know, amount of glee when it comes to, like, replacing people with, with machines. Hmm. And I, I think, I, I don't want to go there. And I, 
it's important for me to technology to use technology as a way to, to, to you know connect people instead and that you have to create a system in which the the human is absolutely necessary what i mo moving from computer vision to sort of related fields like like ai and things like that and the sort of questions that i'm asking myself now is is how we can you uh make again tools and and pieces but that aren't just about you know press the button and you're going to have you know beautiful music running for like uh, a decade and then we don't need composers anymore right uh, instead of, of coming up with, with systems that, that, like I said, you know, and that's why the dancers are important because, you know, it, it, it all comes down to, to the people and, and their bodies. And, and so the, the, these are the sort of questions that I don't think they bother me, but, but thinking if I'm going to make uh, tools again, uh, I want them to, to be really, you know, human being required tools. Right. Well, I think it's really important to do that. I think I think the human element. You're right. There's like the mm. sense in geek culture that every time you move a person out of the picture, somehow the mm. picture gets better. Yeah. And I think maybe uh, the influence again of of dancers and of dancers on art is one of those things that can always bring us maybe back to home because. Mm -hmm. While you might be able to make a tool that can make a decade's worth of music, mm -hmm. I have yet to see anything that approaches uh, the beauty of a dancer and the, and the human activity of dancing. And so maybe they they are end up being the cornerstone of our stronghold, right? Yeah, it's all. I think it's all about creating a moment and sharing that moment with with people. I think that's all. It, it, it boils down to, ultimately, uh, even if if you had you know the robot that that would just move you know incredibly, you know, make these incredible motions, uh, that would be interesting. But ultimately, it's it's about you know bringing people together and sharing something, sharing an, an experience as as a creator and, and as as a spectator and and as also and when you make the tools, then you have to, to build the tools so that it facilitates these sorts of experiences. Right. Beautifully said. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> Sean Mark, I want to thank you so much for uh, taking the time to talk with us. It's just fascinating to hear about both your life, but also your perspective on things. I think there's a lot for everyone to take out of it. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me on. All right. Have a great evening or morning yeah, you for too. you. Yeah. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. Many thanks to Sean Mark for doing that interview. It was pretty fantastic to hear the many different things that he does and the many ways he approaches it. I want to thank you for uh, listening to the podcast. The other thing I want you to do is take a look at Maxology. That's M-A-X-O-L-O-G-Y dot club, C-L-U-B. That's where the newest versions of Sean Mark's work is, are put. It's a new site that I and some other of my friends and co-workers at Cycling74 have put together uh, to try and bring some attention to this and other externally produced work. So please take a look at that. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next week.